And I guess I um, know most people, but uh, for a couple that I don't know, my name is Hurley Lee. I'm an associate professor here at the uh, School of Information Studies um, at UWM. And I'm also coordinating the, our uh, information organization research group. And this event is uh, organized by uh, our research group, uh, we call it in short, IORG. <laughs> um, so welcome. And today we are very pleased to have a, um, a, a speaker who came from a long distance, University of Toronto. She's a faculty member, and I always am a little confused about you call your school the faculty. So she's on the faculty of the high school there at the University of Toronto. And she uh, is currently there associating for research and the chair of a uh, PhD program. Between 1995 and 2003, uh, she also served as the dean. And uh, prior to that, she also worked as a information professional in cataloging and the systems. So that's a, a quite impressive experience. And um, she is the immediate past president of Elise, that many of us know. That's the uh, and currently she is a member of the Canadian Committee on Cataloging, the IFLA Classification and Indexing Section, the IFLA Working Group on Meta uh, Metadata Schemes, and the uh, ISBE Review Group. Uh, this is also a very impressive list of uh, credentials. And I, I'm sure that people who are not in our field will not recognize these uh, initials. And uh, currently, uh, Lynn is working uh, with the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto on a uh, funded research pro project to study how individuals with mild cognitive in impairment associated with uh, early stage Alzheimer's dementia may utilize multimodal expressions of information such as music, uh, photographs, etc., uh, as memory cues for finding, organizing, and using information. So welcome, Lynn. Thank you. Thanks very much, Curly, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be with you for some of you, I'm very pleased to be with you again, <laughs> and uh, it's lovely to see the progress that uh, the doctoral students are making. Um, and so I figure if you're making progress, I should be making progress too. Uh, but Hurley just said everything that had to be said, so maybe I'll just sit down and finish, uh, finish my sandwich. Um, so uh, as Hurley mentioned, uh, I have been working on a project with uh, the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. It's funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Uh, and actually, uh, we're just getting to the very end stages of that. So uh, just earlier this week, we had a session with uh, the last of our, our participants. Um, and I've actually talked about that, that study um, at various points along its evolution over the uh, last year and a half that I have had a, the opportunity to talk with you. So. Um, uh, what I actually wanted to do today, uh, I will touch on on that, uh, but what I would like to do actually is to um, uh, do three things with you. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a brief summary uh, of where where we are as we come to the end of the uh, Exploring Pathways to Memory study. Um, and then I'm going to give you a flavor of uh, the, the study that is going to be the next phase uh, follow-up to that. Uh, and it give you a chance to have an interactive interlude. Um, and you could focus on the yellow ducky if you want, <laughs> uh, just to put you in the mood for that. And then uh, uh, I'd like to talk to you about that next phase study, where we will be pursuing some of the key pieces that have come out of the uh, Exploring Pathways to Memory, that is uh, looking at the interplay of objects, personal narratives, and identity. So focus on that yellow duck, and I'm uh, just going to give you a little bit of a, a background. So uh, one of the things that uh, we appreciated as, as a result of the study that uh, we have been doing with uh, the individuals with 
uh, mild or early stage Alzheimer's disease, or it is a um, uh, related uh, dementia. Uh, one of the things that we came to understand was the very close interplay between objects and their associated narrative as a means of self-expression and also in the maintenance of some kind of a cohesive identity. Um, specifically, uh, what we were looking at was, as Hurley mentioned in her introduction, uh, and this is where there are little hints in here. This is a little like Trivial Pursuit. There are hints that are built into the presentation for those of you in, in Iowa, in information organization. Uh, so do go back to the roots every now and again. Um, but we were looking at, uh, oh, I have to remember, my way that this thing could uh, change. So uh, contrary to my usual, I will try to be restrained. Um, so we were looking at representative surrogates or tokens uh, and how those might in fact in some way uh, enhance or evoke uh, memory in individuals with mild um, Alzheimer's disease. And what we actually mean by representations are things that stand in for something. People, places, things, events. So if you think about your own life, of course, uh, it is populated by places, things, and events, some more vivid than others, but all of them somewhere. If you have encountered and experienced them, they are somewhere, of course, uh, within, within your, your memory. And at various points may be evoked, called up for you to, uh, to experience. But of course, what we were interested in was, uh, for those of us who um, in our day-to-day -day lives experience that kind of uh, memory recall, uh, what happens when uh, you are in a situation where the, that, that uh, mechanism for recall may be uh, constrained in some way through uh, perhaps a disease process such as Alzheimer's or some other kind of uh, cognitive impairment. So uh, we were interested in how uh, these, these surrogates, these tokens, these stand-ins, we also call them memory cues, um, were uh, used by our participants in the recall of a personal event based on a narrative that they would have, um, have uh, engaged in with us in the early stages of our, of our interaction with them. So we were interested in these three research questions. Uh, how do they use these representations or tokens to um, access their memories? You know, we can't establish a necessary cause and effect, but we could see what might happen uh, as they engaged with, uh, with the tokens. Uh, and how, in fact, did they, these tokens influence their memory recall? And in particular, what we were interested in is how the story may have uh, changed based on its context, the, the way in which it was told, the richness of detail and uh, content that was specific to that, that story. Um, so these surrogates could be such things as photographs, music, textiles, physical objects, uh, something that would evoke uh, through the sense of smell some kind of a, a, a memory. So we were actually going after all of the senses, um, uh, sight, hearing, uh, touch, uh, smell, and taste. Uh, in order to see what sorts of things might evoke um, memory. Now, one of the things, uh, I had the opportunity to actually uh, talk to the doctoral students <coughs> yesterday in uh, their course 901 um, about this research. So I'm, I'm keeping this deliberately brief so as not to uh, uh, put them totally to sleep. But one of the things I emphasize to them is that uh, I, I think we may tend to have an idea of Alzheimer's disease as being something where your behavior starts to change. You put your keys in the freezer, or you forget uh, people's names, or um, you forget uh, something that happened five minutes ago, or you continue to repeat the same story over and over. And I think we have this kind of uh, uniform, uh, one-size-fits-all view. But one of the things that um, we certainly encountered in our own research, and is well documented in, in the uh, literature is that uh, it is Alzheimer's disease, uh, it is a progressive degenerative disease, if you will. Um, however, it's very individual to each individual. 
And so it's, it's not as if uh, we could uh, design a study necessarily that looked at um, a particular kind of uh, evocation or uh, you know, a particular kind of cue that would work with one individual or not with another. But this is, this is qualitative exploratory research, which really gave us an opportunity to look at individuals in a very individual way. So in short, uh, this was not in any way experimental, this was not laboratory, um, this was just really interacting with individuals and uh, just having a sense of, of what would come out of that. Now just to give you a, an idea of uh, some of the, the background <coughs> that uh, we also encountered in terms of our conceptual framework and our methods, uh, we, we were uh, um, informed by two very well-established practices that involve objects. And this is the direction in which the next phase of the, uh, the study is, is moving. Um, the objects and how they are actually utilized in the care of those who are experiencing some kind of progressive memory disorder. So the first of these um, uh, practices, if you will, is the use of uh, memory boxes. Uh, how many of you here have, have seen a, a memory box? Uh, perhaps a, a loved one or a friend or a member? Okay, well, so um, uh, individuals who uh, often you will see these in a, in a uh, care facility or in a uh, long-term residence for individuals where they are invited, they're given an opportunity to put some of their treasured belongings, um, if you will, something, photographs, a figurine, <clears throat> might be a pennant, uh, it might be um, uh, uh, something like a, a hockey puck, um, a picture that a grandchild has done. And they put these in a box outside of their room. It's like a little display case. And uh, so let me just ask you, uh, why do you think uh, it would be important to do something like that? I did say this would be interactive. <laughs> Why would that be important? You can't remember their name. So is it, is it visible outside of their room? Yes, yes. So maybe they so can't remember their name. Imagine a display case that has, or a china cabinet, that kind of idea. Okay, so I'm sorry to cut you off. Oh, just if somebody can't remember their name, seeing some of their um, possessions might let them know that that's their room. Or my kind of personal grounding to put words in your mouth. Yeah. Anyone else? Just as a trigger, right? Just uh, it's something that must have meant a lot to them that they would almost never forget the most important. Quite, quite reasonably. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Anyone else want to offer anything? It's a representation of self. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's And uh, as to, as to why outside of the room where they're living? Wayfinding. Wayfinding. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Comfort. Comfort. Anything else? If I go to visit, maybe it's a place to start a conversation so that I can say, um, Mary, <coughs> uh, what a beautiful China dog you have here. Tell me something about Mary can tell me about the fact that she always raised um, English setters or something like that. So, so um, the memory boxes, of course, uh, I, I think would be fair to say for the individuals, but for those, uh, we could also see them as an opportunity for making a connection with an individual in a very, um, in, a, in a very neutral kind of space. Um, so maybe uh, you've had the, this. Uh, the experience of going to a, uh, a party and you know uh, no one there except the person who's invited you and you know those first few awkward moments while you're trying to sort out where you belong and uh, uh, what your points of commonality are and, and you, you can probably imagine the kinds of conversations in which mm -hmm. you engage until you start establishing some kind of rapport with, with someone and one of the things that we, we've been thinking about is um, if you already have something on which you can begin that conversation, 
uh, that might be a very useful way of making an initial connection to uh, subsequently build on, and it may in fact uh, short circuit the length of that, that process. So my advice to you before the end of the presentation, next time you go to a party, take an object with you and uh, <laughs> instant entree. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, so I, I talked about uh, these memory boxes, um, and this, this practice has been shown in, the, uh, in studies to improve how others such as family and caregivers understand and relate to the individual. I just spoke about that. Uh, they offer a personal context and connection and a starting point for conversation. And this in turn can impact the level of care and foster opportunities for ongoing social engagement. Uh, the second practice that uh, informed the way our study went uh, was something known as common reminiscence. And uh, this is also <coughs> aimed at promoting social engagement and the expression of the self through the use of objects. Now, uh, often these are structured group activities uh, that are aimed at evoking conversation and memories and stories through the utilization of props. Uh, many assisted care facilities offer such programming, sometimes around a common theme. Uh, and commercial firms um, have also produced products, uh, bifocal, memory lane media, uh, have products such as videos, audio CDs, memory books, photographs, slides, and tactile objects, uh, a kind of storyboarding uh, for individuals to support remembering and reminiscing. And uh, Ann Basting, who is here at the university, uh, has done uh, a, a very uh, pivotal piece of work for our study, which is, um, and I've spoken about before, time slips. Um, Anne would be far better to talk about that <laughs> than I. Uh, so I'll just use this as a citation to say that it is a, a group storytelling activity that creates a narrative around a generic photograph and focuses on uh, what I think is really important, the validation of each individual's contribution rather than on the veracity and the truthfulness of the factualness of the story told. Uh, so I think that's an incredibly important uh, research that has opened up a whole uh, variety of, of avenues. Um, but whether we're talking about a, an individual or group activity and whether the objects are uh, selected personally or by others, the practice of this common reminiscence does underscore the validation of self-identity and the expression of self to others through objects as a means of building connection, fostering greater understanding, and remaining uh, socially engaged. Now, findings from uh, our own study where we would uh, first meet with an individual, uh, maybe start off with a question such as, um, Hurley, tell me uh, something that you really enjoy doing Curly would start talking to me through some uh, follow-up probes and so on. Uh, we'd just talk, and Curly would tell me stories. As they say, she would tell stories. And we would make a note of these, recording them as well, and listen for things such as, ah, I remember when, or um, that, uh, that uh, this was really important to me, you know, sort of those emotional cues. Uh, and then at session two, we'd come back with some tokens. Now, we had chosen, as the, the researchers, we'd chosen those tokens. Um, and likely some were better than others, but we were just simply looking to see uh, what sorts of things might uh, be evocative to uh, Curly in, in uh, recalling those, those stories. And at a third session, we would come back and uh, bring the same tokens and some additional ones based on um, stories that had been told at the second session, and we compared the stories across the three sessions to see uh, just what sorts of things occurred. So I'll emphasize again, exploratory, uh, qualitative uh, research, and very, very open based on the individual. Um, so what did we find uh, in some cases? Uh, an individual would pick up the, the token and say something like, this reminds me of the time uh, and, and tell an almost verbatim version of that story. Sometimes they tell the same story and add more detail, uh, sometimes less detail, sometimes they have no recall whatsoever, which I'm not so sure is related to an individual so much as it could be related to the, uh, the nature of the token itself. Uh, and that's just, we're 
just getting at this end of collecting all the data so we have some further analysis to do. Uh, sometimes I use the object to recall a totally different story, tell us a whole new story, and that would give us additional cues to bring the next time. Or sometimes what would happen is they would uh, overlook, or they may look at something and have no comment about uh, the token, but a little bit later would come back. Uh, we had one individual who um, just by chance uh, was involved in a group uh, where I went to speak to uh, recruit some individuals, and he uh, was telling the group about his participation in the study. This was six weeks later, and he talked about a token that he had not spoken to at you know, the final session that we had with him. So he had, across time, a very, very vivid story that he told uh, to the group um, six weeks later. Uh, and we also saw in many cases that the stories became more robust, more there was more passion in the telling of the stories, there was a greater confidence. Some of the other things we, uh, we found um, was that uh, it, this seemed to be, uh, I mean partially, I'm, I'm sure the individuals became more used to, to who I was and, and uh, the research assistants who, uh, who were there. Uh, but nonetheless, um, we did uh, see that the stories, um, insofar as they were retold, they were embellished, uh, seemed to take on a, a greater detail where they did take on greater detail, perhaps in response to this safe neutral space. Uh, so we, we saw that um, this whole idea, and uh, uh, I think, and your research has also uh, illustrated this, this idea of people being in a, a safe neutral space where no one is judging them, no one is saying, well, clearly that's not the way the story went. Um, don't remember that this detail or whatever. It's just whatever comes is perfectly fine and uh, it's as good as anything else. So we're not looking for truthfulness, we're not looking for fact, we're not even looking for truthiness. <laughs> We're simply listening to the stories and seeing how uh, the engagement with the objects may relate to those stories. And we, um, we feel very strongly that uh, this is a very, very strong uh, tool, if you will, um, an application, if you will, for, for individuals who often are marginalized or socially isolated um, and, you know, are understand themselves that, that they are uh, going along a pathway in a, in a disease process um, that has a predictable end point. So we did think that uh, you no, know, to some extent we might be seeing some kind of exercise of the memory function, at the very least uh, some positive, uh, I, I'm hesitating to use the word impact, but certainly some uh, positive association with um, self-esteem. Um, even while we found those things, uh, we also recognized that, uh, of course, this was exploratory research. Uh, we weren't testing any hypotheses. Um, we were not clinically testing me memory before and after. Uh, we were not in a laboratory setting with control groups and so on. Um, and we did have a small sample of individuals uh, with whom we worked. So, you know, clearly not generalizable. Um, the other thing is we worked with individuals. Uh, they were not individuals when in a group setting, and uh, nor did we have an opportunity to actually look at how objects might be employed uh, within a, some kind of group activity. Uh, but nonetheless, we recognized that there might be some pieces from the Exploring Pathways approach that we might be able to um, uh, apply to uh, subsequent research. Uh, so this is... Um, uh, I always have to practice the name here, so we actually just call him Mr. C, uh, which is the uh, which is the easy way out. But uh, through time and space, humans have used objects to express or to explore some of the purposes that animate their own individual lives, as well as those that bound them or divided them from each other. Um, so there's a lovely uh, object down there, and then I'd, I'd like to just take a. Uh, minutes here to have an interactive uh, interlude. So yeah. you can you can 
rest assured. Uh, this is very easy. Slow <laughs> testing. You know, before and after. But what I, I would like you to, to do is, um, if I had said to you today, uh, bring bring here with, with you uh, something that is a cherished object, something that uh, every time you move from place to place, you would take with you, something that you feel uh, is important to who you are as a person. So it cannot be a smartphone, a laptop, <laughs> anything like that. So um, just think about that uh, just, just for a minute. And um, I'd like you to think about uh, if, if you telling me about this treasured object that you have. Uh, so to create that story in your own mind and, you know, maybe you want to tell me about not only what it is, but where it came from, maybe someone gave it to you, uh, what is so special about it, um, why is it that, uh, as, as uh, my research assistant Erica says, if someone yelled fire, this would be the one thing you mm -hmm. can take with you. Curses don't count. Um, so <laughs> just think about that, those kinds of questions and the things you'd be telling me about that object. So I, I don't want to put you totally on the spot, but maybe I could just ask if someone would volunteer an object uh, that they're thinking of. You don't have to say anything more. Anyone have an object they take in case of fire? Moving place to place? Well, when we first moved to Milwaukee last year, there was definitely a flyer from a live speech that someone gave. And I noticed when we got to my apartment here, I'm moving right now. So it triggered a memory of seeing this person speak live, the flyer, the location, and uh, I keep saying Although if it was, there was a fire, I wouldn't for it. <laughs> Fair enough. You volunteered an object. Anyone else? I actually have a set of little wooden animals. They're napkin rings. So, yes. Okay. They're also my bracelet from my grandmother, which is old silver dollars melted down, and she got it when she was leaving a horseback riding trip across what is now the Navajo Reservation in Los Angeles. It's old, old turquoise and melted down silver dollars. Thank you. Anyone else? One last? Well, you don't talk about your grandma. She was wearing her pajama and she just wanna she doesn't have anything to give me except that pajama wear. <laughs> so she just take off and give me that. <laughs> yeah, lovely, lovely. Thanks. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question. Thanks thanks for those of you who were uh, willing to, to say and for those of you who are continuing to think about this. So uh, now I'd like you to think about um, so some people talked about the objects, but now I'm going to bring you all into the room with your objects. I want to think about, I want you to think about how you would talk to the group about your object. And especially if this group, everyone here was totally unknown uh, to one another. Um, so I'm not going to ask you to reveal what you wouldn't say, uh, <laughs> but uh, just uh, sort of by a show of hands, uh, do any of you feel there would be certain things that you might say in a private setting to someone about that object that you would not say when you were in the group? Or anything else you might want to comment on about that? Show of hands, or are you all under full disclosure? <laughs> yeah? I think there would be um, like a more intimate <coughs> discussion of the object, um, maybe more personal feelings. I might share with a family member or somebody I'm very close with as opposed to a large group of people that I know at different levels. Okay. Anyone else? I was thinking, my address was this bronze fisherman that my grandfather left me, and I don't know why he left it for me. He passed away when I was young, and he left this for Ellie. And so I have this object, and I have no idea why or what it represents. <laughs> so I think I would say something like this is, fisherman and my grandfather left me, he was never a fisherman, <laughs> whatever that means, but I don't think I would talk about like the distance of our relationship with him. We didn't have a relationship whatsoever because of 
family dynamics. I don't think I would talk about that with everybody as much as this is a really cool Browns fisherman <laughs> or whatever that is. You would make up a story. Yeah, like, <laughs> <"Where's> <laughs> the yeah, I would do something, but I don't know if I would talk about that. Anyone else want to say anything? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just take that as a, a group reluctance. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, so, um, sort of germane to, to uh, some of the questions that I was, was asking you, and uh, uh, questions about, you know, uh, how we might take the, the research that we've done on exploring <laughs> pathways to, to memory and, and extend that. Uh, these, the, Concepts of objects, narratives, and identity are, are recurring themes, if I might put it that way, or, or foci. Um, and so objects, obviously. Narratives are storytelling and aspects of identity. And this, uh, this table actually, uh, in a very social science way, um, summarizes actually what we're, the, the direction in which we're heading. We're, we're interested in, in comparing individual and uh, group manifestations or interactions, engagements around each of these three areas. So how each element plays out uh, w within the study. Uh, if we're looking at personal objects, they can be regarded as concrete reflections of what is meaningful in one's life. And we, we heard uh, some, of, some of those stories. They can convey our values, our goals and aspirations, and they can serve as a, as a form of self-expression all of which may be more or less aligned with, uh, with social norms. We might find ourselves uh, revealing different things across time as we become more engaged uh, and comfortable with the group. Uh, an object's meaning is invested by its owner and, and is expressed through narratives that are told about it. And ultimately, those narratives are mm -hmm. about the self. So through storytelling, we self-reveal and we tell things about ourself. The thing about personal objects is that, uh, given an ambient environment, um, they can be seen to be uh, assisting in the stability of self across time. Uh, they are touchstones. They are a kind of uh, what Hannah Arendt called a form of ballast, individual ballast, that are constantly instructing us in who we are and what we aspire to, making our past a, a virtual, substantial, part of our present, uh, as, as put in the words of, uh, of McCracken. In addition, objects and their associated narratives and meanings have properties and elements that allow them to be uh, categorized in terms of affinities or similarities and distinctions, differences, although not perhaps in the same way by any two people. So for example, uh, we might um, uh, have the same spoon, which depending on one's perspective, uh, could be seen as a tool or as an heirloom, a family heirloom. So objects themselves could uh, be seen as uh, something that can play in the role as to how individuals integrate or differentiate themselves in, uh, from others in society. Now that's uh, from uh, the, the previous uh, authors, uh, Mr. C. and Rocheberg Colton. Uh, we also have, of course, within uh, material culture studies, issues of cultural property. And here's, we, here's where we start getting into more of the, the group uh, perspectives around, around objects. Uh, discussions about the repatri repatriation of cultural objects from foreign museums to their land of origin, antiquities and religious artifacts. Uh, these speak to the roles objects may play in maintaining a sense of cultural history and identity. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, uh, in the high school at the University of Toronto, Tara from Pottage, uh, is doing work with the Haida people and uh, repatriation. First, um, in fact, of ancestral human re remains and now in objects from the Pitt Rivers Museum uh, in Oxford. Uh, so it was a very critical um, focus of research within uh, museum studies and uh, museology and cultural, material culture. Uh, but this, um, uh, objects also can be a means of shared understanding. Uh, these sorts of things are discussed within the literatures of management and organizational behavior. Uh, and they can also be seen as facilitating 
cohesive organizational culture using artifacts to um, bring people together uh, around what we would call communities of practice, for example. So the artifacts might be interests or, or uh, documents or practice or work practices. Now, just to go back to uh, individuals, but from the perspective of narrative, individual stories or narratives can be viewed as exercises also in self-interpretation. So how people find and make sense of, uh, find meaning in and make sense of their experiences. Um, Baumeister and, and Newman in 1994 have identified what they see as four needs for meaning um, that guide the construction of a self-narrative. So uh, Baum, Baumeister and Newman say, uh, first of all, stories satisfied a uh, need for purpose of purposiveness by depicting the attainment of significant goals or fulfillment states. Others satisfy a need for justification, portraying one's actions as consistent with values and norms and expectations. Uh, explaining intentions in a comprehensible, acceptable fashion. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and how I'm a really good citizen or how I pay my taxes and that sort of thing. Whether I do or not, that's the story I'm telling you because I want you to accept me within um, the current social norms, assuming we all pay taxes. Um, other stories satisfy a need for efficacy, self-efficacy, uh, and help us to, in a sense, situate ourselves within an environment and to try to keep that as constant as possible. And finally, they say, fourthly, many stories support the narrator's claims to self-worth by portraying him or her as a competent and attractive person, at which point I will break into a dazzling smile. Uh, so, four characteristics there. Uh, Brunner considers personal narratives or autobiographies from a constructivist stance. Uh, Self-told life should be interpreted not as a record of what happened, which is in any case a non-existent uh, record, but rather as a continuing interpretation and reinterpretation of our lives. Uh, but while this personal meaning may derive from an interpretive feat, autobiographies do follow a common formal structure based on cultural and linguistic norms. Life stories uh, must mesh, so to speak, within a community of life stories. Tellers and listeners must share some deep structure about the nature of a life. So if I'm telling you about my life as a Martian, you might not relate to that. Uh, but with this, we share a common deep structure. Um, because otherwise, tellers and listeners will be alienated by a failure to grasp what the other is thinking or saying, um, uh, where that is out of sync. So um, what? What we're doing here is looking at the links between, uh, within the narrative, between individuals and groups, where the storyteller and the story listener must have some common ground for understanding. And then there's also the work in sociology uh, um, of Irving Goffman, the presentation of self in everyday life. So what we're uh, looking at then is individuals maintaining a cohesive self and adapting narratives and behaviors in order to uh, fit within an audience or a context. Um, okay, so given uh, those areas there, the objects, uh, both as they're manifested within an individual or group context, the uh, narratives of the autobiographical and those that are negotiated, and, and identity, and how I may use objects and narratives to express who I am and then to compare that with uh, how this um, is expressed within a group context. Uh, what we have surmised from the, this review of the, the literature and of that uh, theoretical framing is that uh, while the literature does look at the role of objects relative to individual self-narrative and expressions of identity, as well as to group narrative, it's the link between the two that, uh, and the affordance of objects that seems to be lacking. Hence, um, where we're heading with uh, the research looking at the role of objects in negotiating individual identity, so the ones that you told us about, within a group context. And what we're very interested 
interested in is where this articulation of a common identity within the group is mandated by a coordinated communal assembly of objects, or community display kits. And I'll explain in a minute um, uh, where, we're, where we're going with that. So I've already made some reference to uh, some of the uh, literature framing this, but you can see in the, uh, as we talked about in the doctoral class yesterday, uh, the great uh, liberty of working within a discipline that is interdisciplinary and looking for ways of, of uh, connecting multiple threads. Uh, we do see opportunities for bringing together the models of autobiographical memory, uh, the literatures of self-narrative and narrative, actual narrative structure, the structure of linguistic and cultural, the literatures of material culture, reunion, repatriation studies, and repossession. Uh, some of the work I know, and we've been doing the performative aspects of memory and narrative, and the uh, sociological framing of the presentation of self in everyday life. And um, each of those will also, those uh, theoretical framing will help us to uh, address uh, what we see as five research questions. So here's the affordance of objects to self-revelation, the stories that we tell about ourselves, how private narratives, some of you talked about objects that are near and dear to you, uh, that narrative, how might that differ in a, a public space, the object is constant, it's the teller who is not. How are changes to the self-narratives used to either bring oneself closer into the group or to differentiate oneself from the group? <coughs> How will these objects facilitate or uh, uh, act contrary to the negotiation of a communal identity? And um, how might we use this object narrative approach to foster connections within uh, groups who may be marginalized, isolated, whether that's linguistically, um, through uh, perhaps newcomers uh, to a community, and so on. That list could go on. So how are, how are we thinking we're going to do this? Um, so what we're, uh, how we're planning to, uh, to do this study is to uh, look at both individual and group storytelling around selected objects. And the objects will be, of course, so, uh, chosen by the individuals themselves. So uh, we're looking at two separate groups of four to six individuals who will be recruited from um, three different kinds of, of areas. Uh, first of all, uh, an immigrant and refugee services program in Toronto. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, a regularly scheduled, so there's uh, those who are newcomers. Uh, secondly, the regularly scheduled English conversation circle that is offered to, uh, quote, landed immigrants and refugees at the Toronto Public Library. Uh, and third, a memoir writing group that meets regularly at the library. And actually, a library support group something called the Sunshine Centers for Seniors, a uh, triple S program, they call it, of regularly scheduled uh, social opportunities for active older seniors. So individuals who, uh, in contrast to the previous study, are uh, going through what they call in the trade healthy or normal uh, brain aging, uh, which we're all undergoing. So these, this will offer us eight cohorts. And so what we'll do is, um, we will ask uh, each individual to tell us the story about their object. That will be the private session. And then uh, we will come together as a group and uh, they can tell their story about their object in uh, public. Uh, we will, in their group, and we can uh, compare those two narratives uh, to see if there are any changes, what kinds of changes, and so on. And that one, what we're going to do is ask all members of the group to put together, to curate an exhibit of their objects. So these are you know, randomly brought together objects, uh, all of their own stories. And we're going to ask them to bring them together, to create a common story from those different objects. And this assemblage, we're going to ask them to name it, to label it. Uh, and uh, again, mm -hmm. very, uh, 
exploratory. We let them go, see what happens. Um, and uh, so they will bring them together. Everything must fit. There will be some very basic ground rules. Everything must fit. And we are interested in seeing how that uh, group assemblage, the uh, display case, if you will, is uh, negotiated. Uh, how they come to the commonality. And one might imagine, for example, that we could see those who may, in, as in any negotiation, give over something about their object in order to, to fit, um, to more closely identify with the group, and some who may engage in some dissociation. But nonetheless, uh, this will be their, if you will, assigned uh, task to do. So what we're looking uh, for ultimately is how the I, the representation of self and what the self finds meaningful, may have changed over the course of the activity. Uh, what, uh, what are some of the responses to the circumstances or shifts in uh, perception and understanding? So just to revisit that then, we will have an opportunity to do a private session with them to look at their personal objects and then to see how they come together and create a communal display case with our object, objects being the focus there, uh, their life storytelling through the object, how does that change, does it, in what ways, why not, if, if, if so, why, uh, in the, the uh, communal story, and uh, how self-expressions may also shift or change uh, and how the community itself um, expresses itself. Uh, so we're, what we're looking for then is uh, further applying what we've learned from the Exploring Pathways to Memory uh, research. And uh, we're also looking for two other outcomes, uh, coming up with some kind of a conceptual model, so uh, something that would basically um, fill in the blanks on this kind of uh, uh, structural framework. So what do we see in terms of um, the role of uh, objects in individual narrative and then in negotiating common meaning. And then out of that, what we would ultimately, in a very practical application, looking at a set of guidelines and activities around objects that uh, could be used to build this common understanding, fostering, um, bridging, and connecting, if you will. So why do we think this is important? So I, I shouldn't presume that it is important, but why we, why we think it is important? Um, we've alre already seen that uh, many libraries and museums have, have recognized the importance of, let's bring it back to our discipline too, uh, the importance of objects in individual identity and reminiscence and in social interaction. Uh, there are libraries, for example, um, in the UK that are creating generic memory boxes that can be uh, loaned out to individuals. Um, museums and galleries, uh, the Museum of Modern Art it has a program, uh, activities that focus on particular uh, artifacts or works of art to foster memory recall and self-expression. Uh, this is done with uh, individuals uh, with Alzheimer's disease. And there's another form of museum experience involving uh, individuals bringing a personal, an object of personal significance to contribute to what's called the pop-up museum model. Some of you may uh, know of this uh, and we don't care with this year. And this evokes a uh, conversation through the sharing of stories for personal objects. So sometimes we see this sort of activity through community efforts such as quilt making uh, or getting together and uh, some artistic expression of commonality. So we're looking at how objects might be a, a part of that. Uh, we think that findings may have some policy implications for cultural institutions, libraries, museums, archives, art galleries, where collective meaning making activities could be conducted using objects from the institution's own collections. So where all of you are in the business of uh, creating systems and services to support uh, repositories and collections of information, uh, could we, uh, and objects and artifacts in many cases, could we make uh, could we be entrepreneurial and think about other ways in which we might make those collections more meaningful to the lives of individuals? So uh, we could think of opportunities for 
using those collections to foster community building, uh, encouraging communal curating uh, through the assemblage of artifacts chosen from a collection and ask everyone to go through, choose their favorite objects and figure out uh, their commonality. Um, and I think this does hold promise for institutions that are uh, tending to incrementally shift their focus from um, the collections to those who are uh, using them. So we might say if cultural institutions collect what is characteristic or expressive of community identity uh, by means of an artifact, and communal group identification with that same artifact, that this could possibly create some kind of a common bond through the affordance of same objects. So bringing people together who have uh, diverse backgrounds or who may be isolated because of language or um, status in terms of their recent arrival in the community or whatever the impediment might be, having a common point to bring them together. So, in essence, cultural heritage institutions as champions of community identity building really is not far-fetched when the object as connector is considered thoughtfully. So ho hopefully uh, where we see this research going is uh, seeing how objects may serve to bring us out of ourselves and also together. Relationships and perceptions may change even though the object remains the same. Now, much of the literature addresses either self-identity or community identity separately and respectively uh, by assessing the role of the object in connecting the individual self with the collective of community, uh, a noticeable gap in the theoretical literatures that have been identified uh, earlier uh, may be addressed, however, um, incrementally. So, thank you. And I'll ask for your help with this assemblage of uh, brain power, comments, suggestions, questions. Um, I'm curious, and I think your answer is going to be it's, it's always different or all of the above. But when you're um, interviewing these people about their memories and you're putting a token, are they proud of themselves after? Are they disappointed in their answers to you? Are they different? I'm just curious about that. Sure, and a great question. Uh, we, we have tried to uh, encourage uh, uh, create an environment where there's no sense of testing or monitoring or judging. It's just basically, um, and sometimes uh, our most recent, recent participant, for example, uh, said, um, so uh, did you like the stories I told you last time? Like, uh, you know, I'm, am I boring you? And uh, said, your stories are wonderful. I look forward to hearing your stories. So we try to just create um, an environment where it's, you know, it, it, we even have a cup of tea. So, you know, we're just having a, having a chat over a cup of tea. That's but the kind tell, of environment. Uh, but can you tell, I mean, I know you're not, that's not what you're going for, but can you tell personally if they feel better after they've talked to you or they, it doesn't, again, it's probably just you create an environment where it works. That's not what you're going for. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a fair question. Um, it's not intentional, but uh, 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 as I, I think I may have mentioned, um, uh, sometimes uh, we can see them, uh, the participants with whom uh, we've worked, they have a greater confidence. So when they tell their story, you know, they really get into it, they get more passionate. They're tentative often at first, and so I can be too, uh, especially if I was dealing with me. But uh, they're very tentative at first, but then they, you know, by the time they're there, and, and part of it, as I say, they may be used to us. Yeah. But by the third time, you know, they're, they're uh, really it's engaged little, in the stories. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if, if um, uh, and you have a, 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 well, you have many videos, but there's one on your, your site that uh, shows the time slips and... Uh, She's probably in it. <laughs> oh, maybe, yeah. I'll have to look now. I know, right? Six degrees of separation. Uh, there's a, you know, you can see people, and please correct me if I'm not interpreting this, but you know, they'll be sitting there like this, and, and you actually see their body language mm -hmm. change, and they become more engaged and animated, and, um, you know, uh, no, um, no uh, diminution of any of the research, but I think um, it's a 
colleague, I hope and I know, said when I presented the very first piece of this research in Montreal a couple of years ago. He said that most of his parents have Alzheimer's disease. And he said, at the very least, the research will reassure the people within New York that somebody cares for them. Someone's noticing that and somebody cares for them. So I mean, you know, I, anytime I do this, I emphasize this is not clinical. We're not measuring before and after. We're just watching. We're just trying to be a part and experience what's happening. But thank you. Those were great questions. Uh, a little while ago, you uh, did the experiment with the room and mm -hmm. asking people to volunteer uh, personal objects. The one thing they would take in the case of a <laughs> hypothetical <laughs> fire. Um, so it was not uh, surprising for me that people uh, brought up these very personal objects. Um, but what struck me was that I just noticed that at that moment there was only, yeah. uh, only two men in the room. And, um, you just notice now? <laughs> not now, but then, when we were in the spirit. <laughs> Uh, but and neither of these two men talk, right? Volunteer object. But the others all brought up objects in relation to the relevant, right? So I, I don't remember what the Tina said, but all the others, I think two grandmoms and one grandpa, right? So that, that struck me. I was thinking maybe there is a gender difference there. And women tend to talk about these objects in relation to their loved ones. Is that true? Or and I, I just remember that one time I can't remember the last time or the time before that you did the talk and you, you talked about this man talking about the Catholic school. You know, so so many men tend not to talk about the very personal objects, very personal relationships, like that's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And women really think of all these objects in relation to their, 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 their relatives, their friends, their, you know, colleagues, more. Well, and I think in the spirit of fairness, I could ask if, if you know, oh. the men would like to say anything. <laughs> no, I already <coughs> asked the question that you'll probably think about very personal objects. No, you're right. But obviously, men don't open up about their feelings about it. It's not that I was shy to do it in the group, I just honestly don't have an object that I was thinking about it, but I didn't think of anything that I would save in case of a fire. Like I don't have a shelf of, I have like pictures of family and friends and stuff that I keep, but I don't have like one particular object that I think if the place was on fire, I would just, I'd get out of there. I'd take the, I'd take the, that's the right answer. That's the right answer. Yeah, the money or the, you know, the people, the money. The people that are there. But I was even thinking that maybe some man would, the first in instinct would say a trophy, you know, instead of a bracelet or whatever. That, you know, I, I, I don't know. That's yeah, well, and I, I you know, I, that is something that we're, we're not actually, uh, we still have some fine change, but we, you know, there may be gender differences that, that we do see. Uh, however, um, uh, I don't know whether any of you, uh, I saw this in on our community broadcast corporation, our CBC television news, but I suspect it was a, or it was a, um, it may have been something that was filmed just generally, but after uh, uh, Hurricane uh, or Superstorm, <laughs> Super size, Sandy. Uh, there was a gentleman, I think he was in New Jersey, and uh, he was, uh, actually, he was talking to one of the CBC journalists, and he had a photograph, it was a picture, it was his wedding picture. Um, and uh, he still had the photograph, but it had um, scarred his wife's face. Um, to be blunt, I, I find this difficult to talk about, but you know, they've taken away part of her nose, and he was holding this photograph, and he said, I have lost everything, including my only picture of my wife that I love. Now, she, she was deceased, obviously. And I thought, you know, um, uh, and he, he's telling this reporter this. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know, Kirby, that uh, we may find this, but uh, we may not as well, or we may find dynamics change. I mean, this is what we're in, we're interested in, in seeing what um, how how people do 
take something that's an expression of them themselves, and a trophy can be an expression of itself. <laughs> it's you know, it's right. a remembrance of an event. Um, you know, we'll see what how people deal with all this. So maybe there's a gender difference, maybe there's not, there may be cultural differences, there may be linguistic differences. We're just kind of throwing it out there, like I have a question and a comment. The comment first, one is that this also made me, and your question, um, made me think about um, that video I sent you, about the, the guy. There's this. There's a film about music and its relation with um, older people. And it was really interesting because I sent you this piece where this guy would give him a, I don't know, three iPad, whatever, with music on it, and just watching his whole demeanor change, which I thought was really, really interesting. So that's the comment. And then my question was about um, the refugee community. Uh, because from what I know about the Canadian or any refugee community, I can imagine that for some people that this might be a difficult thing to do. Partly because, I mean, there are possibly some people who don't have objects that are Absolutely. particularly close to them or they might have had one that they lost in the refugee experience. Um, and I'm wondering if you have like what are you going to do to, you know, or they don't have that, or they don't want to share it because whatever it is is too horrible or painful, or the fact they do share something that is, that leaves the whole room in terror. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was wondering how you thought through that and what you were going to do. Um, and that's, thank you, that's a uh, really wonderful, uh, insightful question. Uh, and needless to say, our ethics review protocol <laughs> um, it's going to be uh, very, very vigorous. And in what we would anticipate, uh, now it is an immigrant and refugee uh, center, so okay. we, we will do a, a fair amount of discussion, negotiation mm -hmm. up front. But we, I would envision within the consent form uh, putting that kind of language, that, okay. uh, you know, in terms of a risk, mm -hmm. uh, so that individuals who choose to be there with no witness or who choose not to, to participate. Yeah. Just because I can foresee, like, there was that, what is it called? There was the book by the, the child soldier from, I can't remember it was, mm -hmm. but like reading that, and I remember just going, like, you know, you sit there and you're frozen in just disbelief, and I can imagine that things like that could come up. So yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, with the exploring pathways, I would always put the disclaimer, I am not a clinician. Yeah. I am not a, I am not a uh, yeah. uh, psychologist or social worker. But it's interesting that you could get some very interesting negative stories, like stories about objects that no longer exist. So, yes, that's true. On that same point, though, there's also the, the possibility of creating a new object yeah. as well, which is the, the fictive. Uh, work, uh, Ellen and I worked on a project where we, um, was based on the story of the Odyssey as a prompt, and asking people like Penelope uh, from the story of the Odyssey, what do, what do you endure um, every day? And they all came up with you know all kinds of different stories, and then we actually made them into objects as talismans, that you can manipulate the object yourself so that it becomes separate the, the fictive element actually helps you separate and connect beyond, which is, I think, the core root. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm like, where's the fiction? <laughs> where is the fiction? Um, you know, there, it reminds me of, of there's a, a museum in LA that's a pretend museum. Mm -hmm. uh, every object is made up and has stories around it. Or a, a play I once went to, which was a huge rummage sale, and you had to pick numbers and then he would go to this giant dusty book and, and go to the number of the object and match the object with the story and they were completely made up and you didn't even know if they actually correlated to the objects in the room at all. Um, which sort of underscores this, this separation between the self and, and where the connection between the, the, the two people can really come uh, is through the co-creation of, of something new together and whether that's a, the common communal identity, the common communal object, the common that something is bigger than the individual object and the individual story. Mm -hmm. um, in whatever way that is, a layer of fiction that makes it bigger, a layer of multiple identities put together so that it's it's the, the person's inside of something bigger. Mm -hmm. um, that it's 
has a, a use factor and a, and a value factor, which uh, all of the theoretical grounding that you, you pull in here, I also was like thinking of, um, which was great, um, of uh, social capital is essentially what you're adding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Through the, the people who have stigmatized identities, um, the, the communal process of meaning making is adding value to a person who has lost value. Um, through story exchange. Um, so. And I, I think that, that your work in, in time slips, um, as we were doing our research, one of the things we kept running up against was, uh, even, uh, you're probably familiar with the work of Ron Becker, and that, that he, he worked with, he's, he's a computer scientist, but in the human-computer interaction. And he, um, he worked with 12 families uh, where one of the family members had Alzheimer's disease. And they, the individual would tell their life story and then the family members would add and put together a video which was the individual's life story. But what we were grappling with is the fixity of that. So that's like a one-time story. Everybody had their hand in it, the individual, and then, you know, uh, I'm not picking on her, I'm just, you know, then Hurley would say, well, Lynn, but you forgot to tell this part of the story, or, you know, this is what I remember that part. So, you know, there was a fixedness to this, or a uh, sense cam where someone wears a camera, and, you know, all day long. Can you imagine watching yourself, watching your, your day, replaying your day? But that's the idea, you know, replay uh, your, your day. And it was sort of like, you know, the value is in recreating. It, there's no room for a new self. And I think that that's one of the things that we found so exciting about your work, that it was the self who was the self at that moment. That's what matters. That's what's valuable. Um, and I, I, anyway, I, you can tell. I could probably get quite passionate about <laughs> this, uh, but I do think that it's, it is that you know, it's a, the valuing of the individual in, in that particular time. Um, so maybe we also need to dip into Buddhism to mm -hmm. help with some of the perspectives around this. But that's fascinating research. To talk about a little more. I was just trying to think about what she said about the genders, and I know that when we do time slips, I was just thinking about observing how men respond, and you have to often ask, you know, tell me more about that. So they might make a comment, and it's usually referencing a fact, and then you kind of, you do have to, you do have to dig in a little bit more, and I don't think I ever realized that until you brought that up. Um, but they often tell stories of, like, representing something in history, or you know, just stating what's happening, if the, they're holding hands, then they're married. Or like stating what's happening as opposed to feeling love. Um, and that's not, it's not an absolute, but um, I think there's just a little bit more, but they can do it. You know, it's not something to say, you, you shouldn't ask men questions like that, because <laughs> they have a lot to offer, obviously, but it's good to have that diversity. I, I'm wondering about, I know you, when you presented to us during class yesterday, Said that you were providing the tokens, yes. and you actually discouraged them from bringing their own tokens. That we one guy. We didn't them. encourage them, but one individual. Yeah, that one, one guy brought his tokens. Yeah. And one came with a map to show us the map. Okay. It, it sounds like you've also we've also done stuff where they actually they bring in their own token. And what is the difference between that? Because it seems obvious that. A personal token chosen by the person would have a stronger association with them, yes. but there may be an exercise there in trying to ascribe to a, um, um, a prescribed token. Mm -hmm. So I wondered what the purpose was and what the differences between those two kinds of tokens. Sure, great, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, there was a sort of a practical reason um, uh, working with individuals. Uh, with mild Alzheimer's, although they can uh, give informed consent, we were also respectful of the fact that they might be a vulnerable population. Um, they can give informed consent, but you know things can also change across the course of, of the study. So we were trying to be respectful of finding a comfortable, uh, neutral, common space. So we, we were working within uh, within the Alzheimer's Society. We had a space that they let us use, and uh, we worked actually with a couple of, um, uh, they were independent living facilities, uh, residences, where we had a common room where they had the library we could go and sit. 
So uh, we did not ask for permission to go to their rooms. Uh, some of them said, would you like to, uh, oh, I could show you this. Uh, but we, so we felt a little constrained by that. Okay, so that's part of, part of what I would say. But the other part is, uh, so the, the one person who uh, came to the very first session, fascinating, especially for those of you in the room who are into uh, information management, he came with a stack of papers. They were newspaper clippings, really nicely done up in clear plastic sleeves. Uh, they were documents, they were letters. Um, uh, and he then proceeded to do this. And he went through and he told us his story. Okay. Um, we listened to the story relative to, to these things. So then the next time when we, that was the first, the first session. And then the next session we came back and uh, he, he brought them again. And um, uh, we said, well, would you, would you mind if we just um, started off looking at some of these things that we've put out here on, on the table? Uh, so, he could go to them if he wanted to, but we tried to encourage him to start there. And, and a couple of times he did stop and say, oh, I, I want to go back here. So, th these became uh, an enhancement or an augmentation to the story. And just as sort of a, a light aside, um, uh, this individual was talking about uh, receiving, he had, he had received an honor, um, uh, a ceremony where the queen was visiting um, where he was living, and so she actually put the pin the medal on him. And uh, so <laughs> we had a token, it was a, a little matchbox, which was a uh, celebration of um, Queen's first visit to Canada. So it had the, the very young Queen and Prince Philip uh, on it, and, and he, he picked up, he said, oh, there's the Queen, oh, she's such a beautiful woman. Well, she's still beautiful now, but she was so, so pretty then. And he said, um, then he told us the story. Now I met the queen, you know, and he told us the story. And then uh, towards the end of the story, he said, oh, just wait, wait, wait a minute, I'll be right back. He leaves the room, and we just assume maybe he needs to take a break. And he comes back, and he's got a huge picture, <laughs> a framed picture of the queen that he puts down on the table. I and mean, he carried this thing in, and he says, this is the queen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so he'd taken it out of, of course, is our um, head of state. Yes, yes. yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and so it's out in the main, main lobby. It was, it was, this <laughs> is the way. Um, so he, uh, and so then the third session, um, we actually caught him as he was just heading out for a walk. And he, uh, we set everything up, but he had just at the very end forgotten that we were coming. But that's okay, and he came, so we didn't have any of this. We called them props. And uh, he, he was very animated, told us all sorts of stories and so on. So, one of the reasons we, we wanted to use our tokens was uh, we found with him that when he retold a story using his, his it, 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 there, he, he had a set. He, it was like his script. Yeah. So he told us what we called a scripted story, which is not to say he didn't say other things, but it was much more scripted. So that was one of the reasons, you know, when we were feeling our way along with this, but it was one of the reasons we thought, well, what would happen? You know, recognizing there could be limitations, us choosing the token. Um, <laughs> see, I told you to keep your eye on the yellow. Oh, yeah. oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, so yeah, he did. He did go quite off script when he was okay. he said, So we, we wanted people to respond <clears throat> to the to the tokens, mm -hmm. not just to. Um, Bring your object over and over right. again and tell us, see if the story changes. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's part of it. So part of it was ethics, and part of it was um, just we wanted to see what else might happen. And we did think about asking them to bring something, and we talked to, uh, we actually talked to an activationist uh, at one of the residences uh, where uh, two of our participants lived, and he said, I would discourage that because they're going to worry about which object they should bring. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so that then to them, it may feel like they're being tested or changed or evaluated or something. So, you know. Well, we kind of standardized one part of what we were doing. Yeah, well, I can assure you, it was highly non standard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.
forgot to mention the men's uh, also um, the distinguished research in the information organization with our school. That should be the most important thing. <laughs>